The Broken Dub Podcast analyzes what makes Olympic athletes, comedians, writers, and creatives great. Season one is titled Breakthroughs. This season of the podcast delves into the breakthroughs we have in our respective fields when we destigmatize mental health and move past the roadblocks within our minds. Executive produced by Ellen Utrecht of Mike TV. Um, yeah, so we're take one. Smrr, smash the like, subscribe, follow, you know the drill. This is the Broken Dove Podcast, and I'm your host, Danny Simmons. So everybody, uh, this is the Broken Dove Podcast. Uh, we are joined by an Olympian. I mean, this is beautiful. Jamal Hill, not only is he an inspiration, he is an Olympic athlete. He is a stud. He crushes it. He has a nonprofit that he'd like to talk to us about. And he, more over than this, is a great guy. He's coming here to share his time while he's training to talk to us about what he's doing. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Jamal. Thank you so much for having me, Danny. First things first, it will behoove me. Not a big deal, but a little bit of a big deal. I'm actually a Paralympian, not an Olympian, a Paralympian for Team USA. Same status. Um, and, you know, that, that, that definitely just goes into, for some people, you know, like play equity and, and stigmas and things like that. But same status, same amount of work. Um, you know, we all got to overcome the challenge that we have in life. But uh, right. I'm here today. Um, calling from San Antonio, Texas for the TYR Pro Series. I'm a Los mm. Angeles native. That's where my nonprofit is based out of. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy that you have the time to have me on today, sir. Hey, well, as a fellow uh, native Angelino, it means a lot. I mean, obviously, we know that love runs deep. And it is, it is you know, Paralympic, Olympic, the reality is, is you have done something that is of the not even 99th it's the 99th of the 99th the 99th percentile and and it's it doesn't go unnoticed so and and i think that one of the things that the broken up pod obviously connects with is that the reality is is you only lose when you quit and and i think that that you have this that that mentality and obviously your story which we're going to talk about is is storied with adversity and how you've overcome so first off i just want, want to stop because it's a new year uh what are your goals for 2021 what do you have oh for sure man i mean just number one is going to be uh making the Paralympic team, you know, just on the on the professional swim side, making the Paralympic team. Tokyo 2020 would have been my first actual Paralympic Games. Um, so, you know, I've represented the U.S. at international competitions before. I've medaled before, but I've never been to a full-on, full-fledged four years Games. Um, so making the 2021 team is a big one for me. One step at a time, you make the team and then you make the podium, you know. Uh, more than anything, man, uh, th that's pretty much the big two right there. Right after the games, hopefully, you know, COVID, this COVID season will have come to um, an exciting end. I'm throwing a party. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you better invite me. I'm getting vaccinated. I'm getting in va vaccine, yeah. Pfizer, Moderna. It doesn't matter. I'm there and I'm, and I'm doing it. So obviously, <laughs> so, you know, you, were, you had your goals in your eyes set on the Paralympic Games in Tokyo. And a lot of athletes have had to pivot. How have you had to pivot and how does that inspire your actions today? One step, one stroke at a time. Absolutely. First and foremost, I'm a black man living in America. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the things, you know, outside of just obviously the, the global pandemic of illness, um, I am much more privy, uh, knowledgeable, experience, generation experience with the uh, the global pandemic that is racism, anti-blackness, especially as it is here in America. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, obviously training was was affected. Pools were shut down. Um, shout out to uh, Bossa Boss Machines. They got they got me a and it's a machine. There's a machine in my house now that is it's essentially a bench. It's like a rowing machine, except it's for swimming. So there's one for each hand. I've been on that religiously. Oh, is that the um, but, is that the thing like this? Is that the? Oh, well, it's like it's like the ski machine, only it's horizontal. So I'm actually oh. down on this thing. Yeah, literally is mimicking swimming as much as you can mimic it, um, minus any wall. You know, I, I keep the inside of the house dry. I, <laughs> just staying in shape, man. But I think the biggest thing has just been coming into my voice as an athlete coming mm -hmm. into my voice as an activist obviously like 
I do work in the streets, you know, like I have a nonprofit, I'm already doing it, but really to have this space where it's like, okay, how much truth can I really get away with right now before somebody comes and tells me to shut up? <laughs> no, never stop. Do not stop. That's no, it, you know, it's, you know, it's don't stop. Just keep talking. They, they will say shut up one day, but you just don't listen because you're no, because you're on the path. You're on the good, like just everything I'm seeing. I'm just like, wow. No, first of all, muscle ups, any person who can do a muscle up. I'm like, I am not worthy. Um, but, uh, no, so I've done the Vasa or whatever this thing is. Yeah. And that was my workout in college. I played baseball in college and, okay. you know, I swam. I'm not a good swimmer. I like the meditative state of it all, but I swam when I was a kid. My sister swam. She, she did the junior Olympics, I think junior nationals, which I know is actually pretty high up. I don't know how high. she swam one year in college and then burned out like a lot of swimmers. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's amazing to me is that, you know, we know that swimming has this burnout and and it's mm -hmm. such a repetitive sport you know michael phelps talks about it a lot of i'm sure you know idols in the game you know you have to eat so much you have to train twice a day you have to do dry land you have to do water land mm -hmm. and you know and how do you endure the psychological impacts and then apply that to everything that you do in life mm, yeah that's major i think it, it all starts with just being a student man Mm -hmm. um constantly being a student even you know being number one in the nation right now like uh i still don't know so much there's still so much that i don't know and, and unlike your sister unlike a lot of swimmers you know from ages 10 to 16 i wasn't swimming at all um so that's like for a lot of people the heart of you know that's the heart of their swim career right there mm -hmm. the four years um and then from 16 on to 22 I was a part-time swimmer. The most I ever swam in that range was like, you know, anywhere from three to six months out of the year. Um, so I'm still in a lot of ways, you know, I have a lot of knowledge. Obviously, I've been involved with swimming my whole life, but on, on this higher level, I'm still a newbie. There's still so much work and training to be done. And I mean, you know, so I think swimming is in some ways one of the harder sports, maybe only conquered by gymnastics, mm -hmm. um, in my humble opinion. I think it's all the same, man. Like if you're an elite athlete specifically, like we're all putting in work, we're all eating, we're all trying to get our rest. We're all trying to be the best. And one thing that I really, really loved about this year though, was the topic of mental health. Yeah. Um, Cause that really like, I think took off this year for athletes. Um, and just like kind of getting away from this idea that like, if you're not first, you're last, you know, like mm -hmm. I think that's what burns out swimmers more than anything, you know? Well, I do love that quote because it's a hilarious film that you're, you know, that if you're not Ricky Bobby, I mean, come on, you're not first, you're last, but no, no, it is true. It's like, yeah, the, the Seinfeld idea, right. You know, he, he has a great sketch where he talks about, you know, first place, biggest, biggest legend in the world, second place, never heard of him. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and never heard of. now, now more than that, win or lose. Right. Cause I think that's what mm -hmm. it, it matters is to compete and give it your all and, you know, give it 110% you'll always be a winner. That's something my, my dad always used to say to me. So I, I think it's, it's, that is the definition of winner. Now tell us about, and I forgive me if I'm wrong and if I mispronounce this Charcot Mary tooth syndrome and how yeah. that plays a role in your life. And can you just, you, you know, teach and preach a little bit on that for me? Yeah, absolutely. So that's perfect. Right. So Charcot Marie tooth, you were you literally just half degree off right there. Don't even worry about it. No one's hold, kicking you for it. Hold on. Can I say it once more? Charcot Marie tooth. Charcot Marie tooth. So it's the name of three French scientists who discovered this type of neuropathy. And uh, just a moment ago, right, I told you from ages 10 to 16, I didn't swim at mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. came up pretty much mommy and me from day one, all the way through the age of 10, swim team, the whole gambit boom age 10 happens it's a hereditary neuropathy it kicks in i go through a bout of temporary paralysis i'm hospitalized you know for pretty much for a few weeks paralyzed for a few days um from the neck down i come out of this state you know after a few days and after recovery from a few weeks and now i've gone from this you know fully able-bodied individual to now my brain doesn't have the full capacity to communicate with my you know, my extremity. So pretty much the area from my elbow to my fingertip only has about 30% nerve capacity. And the areas from my knees to the soles of my feet has 0% nerve capacity. Um, you know, and kind of to put that in perspective for people, I give 
two examples, okay? So one example is like being on Team USA, being in the Paralympics, you have to get certified for your disability pretty much, right? They got to make sure people aren't cheating. So mm-hmm. you, go to a, you go to a scientist lab, okay? They lay you down. For me, they lay me down and then they probe me. They shock me with electrical instruments to test my nerve conductivity. Um, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> <laughs> what no you i mean just talking about i mean this obviously it's for you know but what no can you tell wait wait go on just keep going i'm not i just am blown away <laughs> i got you i got you so pretty much you know like i'll be like if someone were to shock me in my chest like you know my, my body's gonna react it's gonna fire off but as they're probing me in my legs and things like that and and you know it's getting a little bit you know iffy here my mom face down, right? So I don't really know when or anything is happening. They're probing me and I'm like, probe is maybe not the right word, but they're poking, <laughs> they're prodding me. That's the way they're <laughs> yeah. hey, probing. probing. <laughs> right. a- p- alien conspiracy theorists are like, they, <laughs> the, he's been probed as well. I knew I was probed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. Never tried. <laughs> so um, you know pretty much like i'm like man when are you guys gonna start this pretty much you know mm-hmm. you know i'm a busy guy i'm on a time schedule can you get it started and then they're telling like oh we kind of been doing this for the last few minutes so there's no there's no relay you know there's no relay and again so imagery that i like to use is imagine a double above knee amputee on prosthetic legs my prosthetic legs just happens to be flesh and bone and they're attached to me so that that's pretty much it. Wow! And and now you know I, I watched some video of you exiting the ocean, and and obviously that video <laughs> depicts that <laughs> quite clearly. I mean, it's you know, the, the, can you just can you just talk about that? You're you know you're swimming like a fish in the ocean. You're you're killing it, and then as you a, exit, a fish, <laughs> or, or a dolphin. I like these. I, I you know, but you know you. You know, and as you exit the the ocean, you know, you're, can you describe that moment and what it's like and, and what it feels like and how you overcome that internally? Man, so that's pretty crazy. So that video that you're referring to is uh, circa 2017. So this is before I had come out of the proverbial closet about my disability. Um, mm. Pretty much, you know, for like 12 to 13 years from age 10 to about 22, 23 uh, you know, I, I look pretty fit, you know, like people can't see it. It's what you call an invisible disability. So I just never, I never announced it. There was a lot of shame around it for me. I was ashamed of it. I didn't want to be it. I didn't want to be associated with it. If you would ask me, was there anything wrong with anyone else? I would have said no, but I also would have said, don't put me with them. Um, you know, so that's really where I was in my life. And at that point I was actually trying out that video was a tryout for the Los Angeles County ocean lifeguard. We're in November here in L.A. County, freezing that day with neuropathy. I'm extremely temperature, temperature uh, sensitive, you know, so like Mm. cold shuts my body down. That was about maybe like less than a mile swim, but it was a full on race. 400 of us out there in the water, the entire race, pins and needles all through my body, straight pins and needles like. Not excruciating pain, but like definitely like, I don't know why I decided to do this pain. Um, finally finished the race, coming into the shore. You know, like you said, I, I'm in the zone though, right? I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. I go to stand up and start running. And literally you can see like, it's almost like my prostate, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to balance on my prosthetic, right? Like I, I mm-hmm. balance on my knees. And I couldn't get my bearings. I couldn't get the angle right for me to be able to have the illusion of moving and like stand on my lower leg with my upper leg. I just couldn't get it under me. And um, at that point, like it was just all well. I was like, I've come this far. I'm stumbling, but I will be damned if I fall in front of all these people while I'm climbing out of this water right now. Um, you know, so so I was still running and moving, but uh. Yeah, that, that, that was it. That, that was pure will. So in some ways, my will has served me a lot. And in some ways, um, it, it definitely became a barrier to the Jamal that truly exists. You know, the Jamal mm-hmm. that does have disability and the Jamal that is just trying to accept himself for himself, you know, regardless of what the world may. 
Now, 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 thank you for sharing that. It's really beautiful that you, you know, coming out of the proverbial closet on with your disability. And, mm-hmm. and so for, for people who have disabilities, what would you say to them? You know, obviously it's a category and we don't want to be defined by these categories, right? How do you say like, I'm going to be myself, live my truth, accept that there is this thing that is out of my control that happened. And then also get, take the power away from it. What do you do to take the power away? More than just talk, what do you do internally in your mind? <laughs> uh, you know that that that's a tough one, man. That that's that's a tough one. I I don't think it's a I don't think it's a how to. Um, I think if I can compare it to anything, it's like I'm not I'm not rich enough to have experiences yet. But I hear, you know supposedly super rich people talk about how money doesn't buy happiness and sometimes the more money they get the less happy they are just because they're mm-hmm. getting farther and farther away from themselves and so for me i came out you know I, I announced my disability it wasn't until i won my first national championship on the paralympic circuit that i had a true mental breakdown and i was like i don't feel deserving of this i feel like mm-hmm. I'm not even owning me yet somehow like I'm in this category and now I'm the champion. Um, and there are people dealing with all types of different things, man. It, it's tough, you know, like how do you tell someone how to love themselves? How do you tell someone mm. how to accept themselves? Like it's for me, it was like, I came to a point and it was like, I had my dream in front of me. I had an opportunity in front of me. And it was like, am I going to let pride and ego stop me from just trying to live the best possible life that I can live? Yeah. And for me, that answer was no. Um, I, I really wish I had, I wish I had the key. I wish I had the key for whoever is listening to this. But, you know, at a certain point, you just come to a decision like, I'm just going to, I got to be me. Otherwise, I'm going to be unhappy. You know, I think, I think it's such, such an interesting thing because maybe it's less of what you say and just people following what you do. Right. Mm-hmm. And Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Uh, said one quote when John Wooden passed, who, you know, John Wooden's a great coach. We all agree. Absolutely. UCLA, and John, come on, baby. UCLA, come on to the day we die. And, Step success. <laughs> come on. It's, and it's amazing, right? Tie your shoes. It's just an amazing thing from the feet up. I mean, these things really, the watchmaker, it's beautiful stuff. And John Wooden said, you want to be a great leader, follow. So I think that you are a great leader, whether or not you're with, with, with that mentality, whether or not uh, you you can say the how to and write it in a book and create the pyramids of success or the steps to success or tell to people what to do. It's just follow Jamal and you'll learn. And so it's a beautiful thing. Listen yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, and at you know at swim up Phil. No, uh, yeah, yeah. And um, and uh, I think it's just an important thing that we follow people and we can't we we can't always explain and retroactively kind of re reverse engineer these steps, but you've done it somehow. And what were some of the things physically you did? So obviously with, uh, Charcot Marie tooth syndrome. I like, I like that. Yeah, sure. I'm trying to put some sauce onto it. No, but what, what did you do to reverse engineer the biomechanics? I've seen some stuff, you know, that you're doing currently and, and how is that improving your, your, your state? For sure. For sure. Um, I think step number one is definitely, uh, Step number one is mentally. It's that it's that mental component. Um, mm-hmm. Really, like deciding that I I respect my body. You know, I, I respect you know this physical reality. But I'm also like not going to be put into a box. I'm also not going to be told what I can and cannot do. I'm also, you know, just not going to limit myself because stats say that I shouldn't be able to, or because the doctor says that I should not be able to, you know, um, I go to doctors again. I just told you that the whole lower half of my body is not whole lower half, but the whole lower half of my leg is, you know, pretty much like dumb weight. You know, when we go to doctors for assessments, they're like, you shouldn't be able to walk. How are you able to do this? And it's just like, I mean, listen, the the human body is amazing. Even more than that, the human mind is amazing. Even more than that, the human spirit is amazing. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And so that's number one, Um, just to believe like people have done amazing things. If, If you think that your situation is so far gone, you need to get on the internet and you need to do some searching because I promise you there's someone who has had what you have or has gone what you've gone through and who has overcome that if even only by a small step you know towards that direction that is considered impossible so that's number one 
Um, number two, you got to just get active and stay active, right? Rest, ride, and mm-hmm. appreciate it. If you don't use it, you lose it baby <laughs> that's, an, that's actually another the, oh, no. i don't i don't mean to interrupt and you're putting out some great there i mean bars but they're also some of my favorite quotes from movies is it true right. if you don't use it you lose it like you're saying some stuff if you're not first or last it, these are also like it's it's you are killing it man i am like damn because everything you're saying i agree with and it's actually true but i'm like jesus these are my favorite movie quotes of all time um, <laughs> for sure I'm- yeah you are i can tell um <laughs> So, sorry, I was interrupting you, but I think what's what's cool is, is that you obviously get in with a, a meditative state in a in a flow state, right? And flow states is something that I've been talking about a lot. It's something that I've been doing, especially in the pandemic. It's hard. We have to find our flow where we can with music and all that stuff. What do you do to get into a meditative state, and how do you repeat these rituals? That's really great, man. Um... I would have to say there's been evolution, uh, not only mm-hmm. evolution, but I would say with my meditative practices, there are seasons for me. Uh, I think all things come in seasons. And, uh, you know, so sometimes my meditative state could be as simply as just following a practical, consistent morning routine every single day. You know, like I get out of bed, I thank God, I do 30 push ups, I brush my teeth, and I make my bed. Um, that's a power five that I can do no matter where I am in the world, no matter, no matter what's going on, you know? So that could be a season. Sometimes my meditative state literally looks like I got to go on a retreat. You know, I, the, the world can be too much. Sometimes there can be a lot going on. So I just, people who know me, they're going to be like, yeah, Jamal, it's hard to catch him. His phone's always on airplane mode. He's in a he's he's in a garden. He's in a garden right now. He's a, he's in a Japanese botanical garden. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> to go on a hike, to go to go into the mountains and, and to spend a day or two. Um, just to just to feel life and to feel gratitude and just to feel like all the things that we think are so big and so much into the world. And again, for the athletes, feeling like, man, like I'm not hitting my time and I'm not gonna win that race, or man. You know, my, my kids are too much or, you know, whoever you are, whatever's going on, just to be able to take a second, look back and be like, again, number one, I probably don't have it all that bad. You know, like yeah, people out there going through way worse, way more often and are somehow, some way still getting through it. Um, and so for me, it, it just it just always brings me back to humility. And being grateful for all these opportunities, because so many of the challenges and struggles that I face are things that I ask for. Like, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, work hard every day to become, you know, a Paralympic champion. I ask for that to, you know, be running a company and have employees and like be, you know, having to train people and do. I ask for that, you know. So, I, children, a lot of people ask for that, you know. <laughs> so often that. Our blessing is right here in front of us. And if we could just take a second and, and pull our hand just out of the fire, we can realize like all the amazing things that this fire is really providing us, providing us heat, providing us light, um, providing us a source to cook our food, providing us a source mm-hmm. to gather our family around. And uh, yeah, so, so that's it. A lot of different ways, but for me, it all comes in seasons. Mm. You know, I love this song by Future Islands, you know, seasons change. Yep. But some people never do. I don't know what if that has anything to do with this, but I, I that actually is something that helps me. I put that song on and I put Future Islands on and sometimes I just I go to a place, right? And find your sacred garden, find your God like you know, obviously I pray as well. And you know, find your light if it's spirituality, if it's meditation, if it's yeah. movies and decompression, whatever it is, you gotta decompress, but also the beauty of this universe is in front of us and it's with our phones on airplane mode. And that will actually, surprisingly enough, improve whatever it is your actual goals are. And that's what the philosophers, the most brilliant minds on this planet have given us that information. And that's been decimated down through all the t- time. And we just got to listen to that because that's truth. I mean, that's why I like kiss plants now. That's right. I got my plants. I'm like, I'm kissing them. I'm, I'm Ralph. I have, I'm, they're named. I mean, it's a little bizarre, but it's a pandemic. I'm alone. 
<laughs> you know, man, but it's not. I talk to my water. I talk to all of my water. You know, I talk to all of my water. Anyone that is, you know, even even taking the tiniest bit of time uh, to just explore the extent of life beyond humanity, to extend the to to investigate the extent of life beyond what we consider, you know, animals and insects. You know. Water is alive. Plants are alive. You know, the scientific studies, there's so much that shows like everything on this earth has some life energy force to Mm -hmm. it. And just because it doesn't speak English or Cantonese or Spanish or French, sometimes that pride and ego can make us think that, you know, we are able to communicate with it, you know, but however, the whole earth, the whole world is constantly communicating, right? So it's like, or do you got the right senses? Are you tuned in to the right frequency? Mm. Um, and so, again, so much of it just comes back to humility, man, and just, like, taking a day at a time, not taking yourself too serious and kind of just trying to open your eyes a little bit wider every day to just all that's really going on in this world. When it, we, we take a, we, we, one a little bit. No, 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 I love it. No, when we take a little bit to absorb and we start to think, we also, I, for me, I'm, I think of the places that are like sacred gardens for me, right? And these, these, mm-hmm. one of the places is a gym. Let me be honest. Like I, mm-hmm. I struggled, you know, I, and I, I too have just recently come out of the proverbial closet. I have, I, a disability, I have a bipolar disorder, severe one, you know, where I have, uh, hyper, a mania where I, you know, psychosis and stuff. It's a bummer. I take medicine. I do it every day and I've, but I've been full remission for five years, but it, you know, it can be a total bummer going hospitalized. Thank you. That up for a second for our brother, Danny. Can we just clap? Come on. For thank a you, second, man. Yeah. Bro. Bless you, man. That's, that's big. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, and it's one of those things where it, like, I, I, I want to lean into not being afraid of opening up about it. Cause you know, some suicide, is something that runs in my family. And, and that, that is something that I didn't really know until, you know, five years ago. And not that, that, that that's something that I ever have felt. I don't want to harm myself or others. Luckily that's not in my spirit. I'm just like a jolly giant. I truly am just jolly. And, but there is this part of an embarrassment and a, a, a part of judgment of my ego and pride that I've, I had to overcome and break through that true sadness of being broken and, and not even just being like, it's actually okay to be broken and then put yourself back together and fly away. And that's why I like broken dove is like kind of my mantra and my mission statement is that you can actually be bent and then you can be broken and then you can put yourself together and then you can actually become a thing that can fly. So like, that's the, the essence of what I believe is my overall purpose. And I think you obviously have your purpose with your charity. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your charity and what's next? And then obviously, you know, what, uh, what's your mission statement? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so charity was founded in 20, 2020, um, officially founded in 2020. Congratulations. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, that's when the paperwork came through, but the work has been going on for the past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they're like, it's always that overnight success, right? Like, yeah. It's like, you know, we already know how that narrative goes. But yeah, long story short, uh, Swim Uphill nonprofit, um, you know, Jamal Hill Swim Uphill mm-hmm. profit. And uh, it is our mission pretty much to increase swim equity in low to middle income communities, prioritizing black families through culturally and environmentally influenced swim education. Mm. Uh, you know so try to keep it simple pretty much words that everyone understands and kind of can piece together uh what mm-hmm. that looks like you know what it, what does culturally and environmentally influenced swim education mean right or, or why is that so important um i think what sets us apart is just that when we come into the especially the swim lesson space uh and we talk about low to middle income communities when we talk about America, when we talk about, you know, disproportionate amount of black drownings and then, you know, uh, even Hispanic drownings, which would follow that. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, Caucasian drownings, which would follow that. You know, there's a lot of people unnecessarily drowning, uh, but you got to go to the to the hottest place. You know, you got you got to go where the where the need is at first. Um, We find that these people just don't have water features in their community. Mm -hmm. So, like, for whatever reason, the people with no water features don't know how to swim and then find themselves near a water feature on a hot day and it's just too tempting and now you know a life is lost Mm -hmm. um so how do we then 
reach a population if they don't have necessarily access to consistently practice to have consistent coaching and trainers and um you know a lot of organizations usually take up this mantle just by trying to find cost reduced swim lessons which i think is good i think it's major important i think that holds a lot of value but it doesn't get to the heart of the problem and so what my nonprofit did uh, we've developed the curriculum myself my business partner, Wilma Wong, who's also my professional uh, swimming coach. And we've developed a five-hour curriculum. So that's one big one. So seldom do swim lessons have a time limit for completion. You know, there, there is no scale depending upon age of how long it should take you to learn how to swim. A lot of times people just get hit with everybody's different, um, which is great for business, you know, like open-ended. We don't know when the project will be finished, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Yeah, that's like an architect. We're not an architect. Yeah. You know, the construction. Oh, we, oh, we don't know when it'll be finished, but don't worry. Just keep paying us. Um, <laughs> so I think the for-profit swim lesson industry has run away with that. And, and you know, it's showing and drowning rates. More than that, though, again, we're talking about access. How do we teach these people? Well, we have to figure out a way uh, to get them comfortable with water to get them basic water safety skills from their own home or their own community and we did that by establishing our bowl bench bucket method bowl bench bucket method and uh, so essentially on a five-hour curriculum course line the first three of those five hours and you know again we've done this we, we have not millions of case studies hopefully one day millions of case studies. no you'll get there case studies we'll get there yeah you will um, you know uh we teach breathing literally in a bowl of water and then from there you know not under the water but the the mechanics of breathing mm -hmm. in a bowl of water and then from there we bring out two buckets of water we teach the forward mechanics of what would essentially be an elementary breaststroke and so by the time we get the students in the water um they really already have a really good good handle on these basic primary skills and concepts and so from there it's like one to two hours to completion uh it would behoove me though real quick not to mention a lot of these communities are dealing with generational traumas surrounding mm. water, right like most often the parents haven't learned how to swim the grandparents haven't learned how to swim children are taught just stay away from it and you'll be okay right just avoid it mm -hmm. and you'll be okay with it true for some people but you know for a family that it wasn't true that they, they can tell that story right um that's a big part of our program before we even start to put them into the bowl bench bucket which not only conquers access but also is a way to ease them into comfort with water we go into a uh, pretty much a mental emotional um trauma healing and we just address whatever fears that they have with water through a soothing technique which is pretty much a self-loving technique, repeating, uh, you know, I don't want to say mantras, but I'm re reciting a practice, you know, with, with one of our professionals. And, uh, you know, we usually don't have to do it for kids. Kids don't usually, you know, come against this, but for adults, um, teenagers, it's definitely very real. People have had near drowning experiences, people who are afraid of the deep end and things like that. And, uh, you know, so we'll get we, we've had one person who survived Hurricane Katrina, literally was stuck on top of the roof as the water levels are rising. Thought they would never learn how to swim, learned how to four hours, you know. People who have had near drowning experience, who have tried to take swim lessons over and over and over through the years, and now they're 60, and boom. You know, once we've overcome this mental emotional barrier, the skills themselves are fairly easy. So, you know, as you can tell, I'm very passionate no 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 this is gave you a lot there <laughs> no no you gave me just you gave me the right i i i I'd love more i mean the reality is is this is something that's so important you know what one of the things is positive self-talk you know you and i i'm a former athlete i i didn't get to the level that you're at but let's be real positive self-talk is one of the things that takes you st top sports psychologists talk about it positive self-talk and uh visualization is something that takes you to the next level as an athlete mm -hmm. and swimming is an athletic performance and it is challenging to do whether or not you're good at it. It, it is hard to get through water and mm -hmm. something about water actually makes the human soul happier. And what we are seeing, at least from my opinion, and this is just something that it's the cheapest way 
to feel better and to soothe the souls to go to the ocean or to go in the water. I think there's something about therapists and agree that there's something when you go to the ocean, you get to engage not only the wind, uh, you get all the elements, you get sun, all the elements you, right there, all the elements. And there's something about it that we can get. It doesn't cost anything. And it's the best form of therapy. And it's the best way to overcome mental illness. It's the best way to overcome what is uh, truly plaguing our society, which is that we're not really, I mean, I think there's like a, a question of what's our purpose and our meaning. And we understand when you look at that endless horizon and you see the sun setting or the sun rising, that there's actually this thing we'll never understand, but it's beautiful and we get to be part of it. So I, that's obviously my preachiness, but then there's another thing I, I volunteered through an, uh, another nonprofit as well. It's called Pass the Stoke and, and in LA and Will Rogers, the bummer for the pandemic is they shut down, Pass the Stoke, give it a look. It's incredible teaching uh, uh, students from charter schools and the projects how to surf. I'm not a great surfer, but uh, it's a similar it's a similar situation on Sundays. Get up at seven a.m. seven to one p.m. Spencer Curry, thank you for bringing me on to that charity. He's a great mentor of mine, and he was there for me. Spencer, he was there for me in my darkest, you know, hour of hours and my, you know, when I was really in the hospital and really struggling. He was there for me, and so. Um, I was able to find true, like a true calling with that organization. And it sounds similar in, in theory that yeah. it's, you know, you start first on sand and you teach, you know, how to paddle in sand. And a lot of it is also learning how to swim and then the standing up and then, the, and, but everything's kind of, you know, a transition, right. You know, from bowl to yeah. bucket to the, you know, and, yep. and, one of the first things that everyone is forced to do is to get in the water and that is fear and overcoming our fears, right? False evidence appears real. Yep. And this is the mind. This is the mind. This is like the biggest, the quandary of them all that all of the things in our lives are in our mind. Now, I obviously would love to hear about how faith plays into this. And, and we talked about how you have your, uh, you know, your nonprofit and we're going to plug it and then the taglines, and then I'm going to make a donation. Like I, I, I really would love to help support you financially. I'd also eventually come on. Okay, of course, you know, I'm not, I'm not swinging, you know, the money is around as much as some of these other guys, but maybe it's also the, the mentor, the mentor money is really that's time. Time is the most important. You know, I even think about when we think about giving back and it's like, can you give money? It's like, no, you give time because we don't, you, Time is the key. So we thank you for your time coming on here. And I think it's obviously was for a reason because we're going to connect and find a way to get some more mentors in LA. I mean, LA is, Absolutely. it's a melting pot for a reason. So it's really beautiful. Obviously every, every nonprofit needs money, but also more than that, it needs human capital. That's a fact. Human capital. Right. Human capital. People forget about that, right? They all, it's the money. And, you know the money and i'll go away the manager you got a money yeah we all know but like your human capital can you allocate those resources appropriately um that's really what's going to determine the impact of your service you know and we're in the nonprofit business so that's what it comes down to no i saw today so you, so what does it feel like when you take someone who's goes i can't swim i'm afraid to death of swimming mm -hmm. and you inspire them to overcome it what is that feeling like for you just you know i mean come on i gotta know what does that feel like? <laughs> what does it feel like? And explain it in detail. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm somebody that like, I'm guilty of like downplaying things. I'm guilty of uh -huh. downplaying things. I'm guilty of like not always having the full breast of emotion. Um, in some ways, like, in some ways, like, it, it, I've become jaded to it a little bit. Like, it's not like, oh, man, like, I didn't know I could do this. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, like, this is what we do. This, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is what we do. And whether you learn to swim in one hour or, you know, everything is an average three hours or, you know, there may be a student who learns in 10 hours. Like, it's just like, I'm here through the journey with you, you know, like, mm -hmm. there is no win. There is no loss. There's only a lesson. Like, I kind of bring that same attitude to my competitive swimming you know like you see me when i don't post my best time you see me when i do post my best time i'm more or less acting the same like my smile might be a little bit wider <laughs> like not too high on the high not too low on the lows like this is what i do this is literally what i train and prepare to do this is why i'm here um 
And, and that's what it feels like. I, I think if anything, like, what does, I think, still get me, like, it all gets me fired up. But, like, yeah, kind of, I smile a lot. I smile my poker face. But, like, one thing that does get me is that when we teach someone how to swim, you know, on this curriculum, and then we're like, listen, now that you can swim, right, the next step is to get you trained so that you can teach someone else. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, really seeing them once they've taught someone is mm -hmm. like, now that's the emotion you know <laughs> that's the emotion yeah to have gone from oh man i'm terrified of water i can't swim at all to like oh man like it's been a week i can swim now and now it's like oh man like it's been a month two months later and now i'm teaching someone else how to swim like what the heck is going on here this is this is amazing thank you you know just that outpour of gratitude, mm -hmm. um, you know, so all of it fulfills me, but I like watching that part, uh, you know, not directly what my hands touch, but what the hands that I've touched touch uh, mm. is what really is what really gets me excited. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, this is, you're obviously on, on to something. I mean, at, at such a young age, you've had so much success and now you're going to like, let's be real. The, the, uh, ultimate purpose of our lives is, is to accomplish things. Right. But really at the, at the heart of it, it's to accomplish, it's to accomplish giving back. Like if that's what I want, like, I, and, and I think that's something you obviously have. What do you, you know, I'm sure you have some wild goals, some wild goals, yeah. 10 years from now. What is this? What's the big, what's the big thing? Like, what is that swim uphill? Not, not just, what is it? Yeah, for sure. So one big hairy goal is to have taught a million people in years. Yeah. Um, you know, so obviously we've drafted a plan like that, uh, you know, 15 might be a little bit more realistic, but like, that's a goal 10 years to be able to have taught a million people, you know, through our programs, through our licensing to city governments, um, our deals with boys and girls clubs, you know, there, there's a whole lot primarily, again, my organization is an educational organization. So while we mm -hmm. host workshops, most of our work is through training trainers. Um, you know, so cool. to be able to have 1 million people taught 1 million, not 1 million downloads, right. Which is hard enough to have 1 million people have gone through a process and now they are a swimmer. They can swim 25 yards. They, they, they're good. They can more than save their life. That's one big hairy goal. 10 years from now, um, 10 years from now, that will be following up 2028. Uh, you know, so that when the Olympics are coming to Los Angeles, uh, come on. So. <laughs> to be quite to be quite frank um I i'm planning on doing some amazing things in between now and then to really be blowing up by the time 2020 happens so come 2031 man um I, I may or may not be hanging up my swim jacket i don't know i may go to 2032 that one is a little bit tough to decide but uh yeah. definitely at this point when i uh when, when i'm like 35 34 i'm looking to a family man I i'm looking to kids um, I have an amazing family unit, an amazing support system as it is right now. And, and I think uh, at that point in time, I would be more ready to actually have children and, and beyond mm -hmm. that, here we go. I'm giving it to you beyond that swim uphill is a brand, right? Like swim mm -hmm. uphill is a brand. Obviously what I'm building right now, super intensely, super strong is our nonprofit arm just cause. Um, impact. I'm service driven. That that matters a lot. I don't think the money is going anywhere. But in ten years, I would really love to see this brand grow into a stronger sportswear brand and marketplace. Um, cool. You know that is you know that that has an opportunity to run with some of the best of them. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, and have people rocking it, have people supporting it, have people resonating with the mission, what we've done, um, and for people to one day be talking about like, yeah, like. You know, I work here. This is mine. You know, talking about swim appeal like as if they were the founder. Um, I think that's all anyone really kind of wants for what they create, right? So yes, you know, <laughs> that's beautiful. And so, 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 obviously, I'm gonna procure some swag. Uh, I saw that you. I don't. I do, yes. Yeah, so I will procure. I don't rock jammers or you know speedos anymore. People would be cr grossed out. My pandem body does not lend itself to that. No, no. But I will get some shirt jammers or speedos. So you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're like we're not doing that. I'm just trying to know, let you know I know the logo, the the, the, the lingo. So so obviously I think 
it's a cool thing to see someone who's so positive and you know you handle adversity so well uh my, my my publicist said this to me yesterday when I was like, you know, should I tell, should I come out with this podcast and, and really reach out to the world and tell them that this is going on? And, and, you know, how do you guys handle adversity? And they're like, I'm a tiempo buena cara, which, you know, I, I was like, oh, I love it. Cause I was like, you guys smile so much. And they're like, it's, when it's bad times, we smile, good times, we smile. And it was like, mm-hmm. you, you obviously embody that and personify that to a T, which is good and bad smiling. I stay grinning and, <laughs> and you know what I mean? It's like, it's like the scariest MMA fighters, right? You'll see p- blood pouring down their face and it's like Tony Ferguson. He's like smiling. And so you're, you know, it's like geeked out and, and it's incredible. Even Khabib, Khabib, Khabib I don't know how to say his name yep. perfectly. Right. But, you know, Khabib, uh, he's smiling and talking to you. And that's like, he's such a, a mentor in my opinion for, so many people, I mean, obviously he's an idol and he's a savage and what a great athlete, but also just the way he carries himself on and off. I mean, a beautiful thing. I think you have that same mentality, which is the winner's mentality, the competitor's mentality. Now we kind of transition from now, which is the, the suffer for good mentality, right? You saw yeah. suffer for good is, is something that Sebs out a embodies that and personifies a similar mentality as you. Yeah. You know, you only lose when you quit. You only um, lose when you give in to these ex- external forces, you know, whether it's 1980 to 1984, not being able to compete in the Olympics held in LA yep. and a place that he wanted to always go and be an uh, Angelino because it's such a beautiful melting pot of humans. And yes, Seb from Ethiopia, all the way from Addis Ababa, reverse, reverses with the doctor who saved his life. But really, it's just a story of the human spirit. Amazing, and amazing film amazing story man. i'm glad i've been put up onto that yeah absolutely suffer for if you haven't checked it out this is jamal hill saying go check out suffer for good <laughs> thank you thank you it's, thank you jamal and and this is our second chance portion of the of the pod it's like a you know and also known by a hashtag stop the stigma give us a moment we'll be right back the broken dove podcast is sponsored by kilo kilo app takes a qualitative approach to tracking your mental health by analyzing the quality of your sleep workout diet even libido kilo keeps me dialed in kilo motivates me to work hard in and out of the gym it also helps me maintain relationships and keep perspective because no matter how bad you got it someone has it worse and trust this we need you out there maybe do it for your son your student do for someone you've yet to meet your inner savage dig in and do work kilo building better humans back in back in my now you are we already cut t- sort of talked about it and I've, I've opened up about my ben- battle with mental illness. Have you or anyone you know in your circle suffered from mental illness? And how do we destigmatize this and overcome the stigma around mental illness as well as just disabilities in general? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say like maybe not. I don't know that I've ever had like a clinical mental illness, but like mm-hmm. definitely think the greatest mental illness plague in this earth is that inner voice that just wants to tear us down and beat us harder than anyone mm-hmm. else could possibly tear us down or beat us. Um, that's something that we all experience every single day. You know, hopefully you're getting better at it. Hopefully I'm better at it. But like, you know, the older you get, the, the more, the more pressures, the more this world places on you in terms of expectations. Um, sometimes the louder and the stronger and, and, and more scary that voice can get, the more real that voice can get. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think number one, the biggest thing is to always just let people know, like, dude, you're not alone. Like, I, I don't care if you're Muhammad Ali, Jamal Hill. Um, I, I don't care if you're, you know, the president of the Philippines. I don't care who you are. You know, I don't care if you, you're the leader of a woman's rights group. I don't, whoever you are, whoever you're looking up to, whoever you have on this pedestal of achievement of perfection, I promise you a hundred percent, they are human. And a lot of those attributes that are in them are in you just the same. A lot of challenges that are in you, if they don't still have those challenges, they had to overcome those challenges in some way, shape, form. Um, And so there's hope. 
there's hope, you know, there's hope. And uh, the world is more connected than it's ever been. And in some ways that makes it difficult, but in some ways it's allowed us the space to have conversations about just being human and it being okay. You yeah. know? <laughs> like I'm not perfect. <laughs> like, I'm sorry guys. Like I know I'll let everybody down. <laughs> like, I'm not, I, be, I go through shit. Like I, I have these where I just don't want to get out of bed. I have days where like some people have days again, where they don't want to be on this earth anymore. You know what I'm saying? And like, you're not alone with that, you know? And I know it's easier said than felt in those times, but that's, that just makes things like this, conversations like this, forums so much more important. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, so so that's, that's really my, my 10 cents on mental health. With disability and disability awareness, I think the best thing that I could say is just like, kind of from my own experience, you know, like, uh, so many of us, you know, whether we're talking about mental health, whether we're talking about disability, whether we're talking about racism um, and bigotry, mm-hmm. you know, for a long time, I was ashamed of my disability and had anyone ever asked me, you know, do you think that Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes are the same? Do you think that they deserve to be the paid the same? Do you think that, you know, that they're the same caliber? You know, my political correct answer would have been, of course, of course they are. What are you talking about? Of course they are. But as soon as I experienced as a person and an individual, you know, being placed into the category of being, you know, a uh, 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 person with fight, battling disability, right? A person in the Paralympics, it was no longer the same, right? I'm now disassociated from this, right? As long as I consider myself outside of it, then I have this privilege. I had this privilege about me. Like, oh man, like, yeah, of course everything is the same. Like, don't worry, like things are good. But as soon as I had that label put on me or, you know, I had to step into this label that was already on me, I'm like, you know what? I actually like, it's really not the same. And it doesn't matter what I say because my actions are speaking volumes like why am i so ashamed if they're the same then why 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 don't i want to do this if there's just as much glory if there's just as much to be proud of um and so i just say all that to say like you know in in that way i was blessed i was privileged quite literally to put on someone else's shoes and i've been walking in them every single day so that's been a blessing for me and it may not have been i i could have chosen not to accept those shoes Mm -hmm. i understand that we all are going to have an opportunity to put on someone's shoes and you can either choose to put on those shoes and take a few uncomfortable steps and yeah. really like, Oh, this is real. Oh, may- maybe I'm not quite as holy and quite as fair and quite as justice driven as I thought I was. Um, but you know, I'll put on those shoes and I still got them on and I'm proud to wear those shoes a little bit more every day. So I just say for all those out there listening, whether you're battling mental health, where, whether you're, whether you're battling, um, justice in your spirit when it comes to human beings in general, you know, disability, it doesn't matter. Just you got to understand that at the end of the day, people are people, you know, and uh, I'm old school. I, I think that what's right is right. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think what's right is right. And it's that simple. And, you know, well, even when you're right, you're not perfect. You know, I like to think I'm a good guy, but I still had those misconceptions. No matter what yeah. else that I still had those inside underlying thoughts and feelings about disabilities and stigmas that I never would have let shown, but were still in my action. So I just hope that if, if you don't ever have the opportunity to experience it firsthand, that you take a moment and that you really just sit and you ponder or you go to an event and you put yourself as near to the source that you think you understand so well um, as you can, so you can understand like you really don't know shit. Excuse my language. You just no. I prefer it. How much you don't know. So Mm -hmm. so you got to get out there. You got to discover. You got to get out there and you got to discover. Anyone who tells me that they know some stuff, I know for a fact that they don't know anything, and that this person is definitely dumber than I am. Because I know I don't know. know? (laughs) I, I, you know, you you said something so so profound, which is you know try to put on you know walk a walk a mile in their shoes or try to put in their shoes. You know, something that we've all now witnessed and and visualized is to to some of the extent recently. Obviously, there are a lot of people who are unable to empathize and unable to see what it would be like to maybe walk in someone else's shoes. I've seen stuff on people's Instagram stories that are 
disturbing and and as a black man can you attest to obviously there are people who say that these things these social injustices are not happening to black people and we most definitely saw the storming of a capital and we know that i mean you would have to not be you'd have to be blind to not witness that if the injustices can you maybe speak a little bit on on that like how have you experienced that and and how do you how can we help people see what it's like from your POV? <laughs> to to keep it simple, I think the best thing that like anyone can do is just go ahead and pick up some history books with unbiased eyes. You know, like we mm-hmm. we live in 2021. We live in the age of information. Obviously, you need to check your authors, you need to look at things, but when you just pull the sheets back on this country as America, what was America from jump? Um, pretty much like you know, and again, this is like nothing to anyone presently. So, like, don't take offense only if it applies. But like, racist Southern slave owners and black people, like, <laughs> like slaves. You know, at this point, like, when we just take America down to it, it's you know, what is it built off of? That's what this is. And so, from that day, from day one, systemically, everything that has come in all. Immigrant, all immigrant groups, all, all peoples that have come in to this American family and this American society are still ultimately standing on the backs of the Black population, which is why, again, which is why, you know, Blacks control less than 1% of the wealth in the entire country, which is why even if you gathered all of the Black people in this, you only have less than 12% of the actual voting power in this nation. I mean, like, you know, I study so much about this. I, you know, I don't want to break it down too much on here because it, it continue. You can, deep. I like deep. Let's. <laughs> I don't. I don't like to force feed anyone or anything like that. Um, but you know, just uh, I think really just at its simplest form. Like again, when we look at America, uh, where did it start? What 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 is the inception of it? What is the constitution? The constitution, right? It, it is a document and it clearly outlines blacks as a subcategory of people, right? From day one mm-hmm. as property, right? Through following legislation as three fifths of humans, even as the second constitution came into, as even as the second constitution, right? What would be the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments came into being right during the early 1900s. Um, and these were meant to specifically be towards blacks and help to empower this class to help bring about some amount of restorative justice, um, immediately these specific codes and rights were then applied to the vast general population of multiculturality, right? Of all immigrants and of all ethnic groups. And that just continued to to dilute, to dilute, to dilute uh, what is this old justice, this old restoration to the black people, to the black population, to the point where we are now Um, you know, blacks are pretty much almost a permanent minority in this country. Um, almost a permanent, almost pretty much a permanent, uh, moving towards a permanent poverty state in this country. Um, you know, obviously you're going to have influencers and entertainers and certain outliers that are able to generate high levels of personal income. But when we talk about generational wealth and things like that, there's just no combating it. There's just no picking up a certain level of ground without everyone being on board, without there being, um, number one, acknowledgement. Uh, and, and I think, you know, definitely just to speak specifically to what you asked me, like about the, the recent situation at the Capitol, um, the recent, you know, uh, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter in the summer. And mm-hmm. you know, I, 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 not, not to be unpatriotic, um, but it's just like, none of this stuff is surprising. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. I've lived this 25 years. My father has lived this 70 years. His father has lived this, lived this another 70 years on so on and so on and so forth until here we are now in this present day America. And only now the same way that conversations about mental health are coming up the same way that, you know, conversations about disability are coming up are these conversations rising more to the surface. And, And I think it's definitely important to highlight a Pyrrhic victory. Um, excuse me if I didn't say that exactly correct. I always kind of mess that up, right? But not really a win, right? 
um, is when we talk mm-hmm. about social integration. We've already been through a civil rights movement. Um, we've been through a civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s, yet somehow Black people are still this permanent lower class, yet, stem, so yet some still somehow every racial category in America gets consumed into this politically white envelope except mm. Blacks. Um, yet still somehow, right? Again, there's this economic, you know, this economic inferiority that is constantly perpetuated. Um, Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether we go through, you know, uh, again, this is like not to speak to, you know, I'm not, I don't think anyone should do anything necessarily, but it doesn't matter whether we have a black, a brown, a white, or a green president, honestly. It doesn't matter who it is, what they look like, as long as they are still going to uphold and and really back and support and maintain what is you know ultimately just the white right the white privilege in this country from day one and uh you know i mean it's a tough situation to be in i think for everyone uh you know and i definitely like you can't tell anyone what to do um only thing you can really do is educate people and just say like yeah you know i think i think there's hope to be had but at the same time when i look through history um, you know, it's very sobering because there's a very clear trend going on here. You know, there, there's a very, 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 very clear trend here. And like some people are just now seeing it. And quite frankly, I think that like it's, it's still going to ultimately lead to inaction. And when it becomes too much, when too many people have seen it and yet no one is still going to take that action to take it to the next level. Well, it's just going to be swept under the rug. Just how it was in the century, in the last century, just how it was in the century before that, you know. There may be, again, some pure social victories, um, but it's important to understand that, like, societies and cultures are not able to live, survive off of uh, social victories. Social victories do not provide resources, mm-hmm. as we can see, right? <laughs> go go to any no. middle-income community in the country, and, and <sighs> the majority of that population is. So, um, yeah, man, like, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, I think that in some ways, you know, this country uh, is reaping what it sowed. Um, and, you know, I think even if, if I may just add one last line here, just that, you know, I understand we all have stories, we all have narratives, um, we all have our own truths. And, and I think one thing that I've definitely heard recently is just like, well, man, like, if it's so hard for black people here, why don't you just go someplace else? Oh, you know? And not saying that anyone per has said this, but this is something that I hear. And I think, again, I think it's important to understand, again, when we come back to literally the founding, the infrastructure of America, like we're not talking about the factories and stuff, right? Factories, that's, that's less than 100 years ago that the Industrial Revolution happened. <laughs> that's the new America. That's after stuff has already been, mm-hmm. all the groundwork and pavement has already been laid. Um, I think just I speak for really all of Black America when I say like, I'll be damned, you know, like so many people died and were and were killed, murdered, fought injustice, like suffered through, withstood to build this country and make mm-hmm. it what it was just to leave and allow the rest of the world to come and like enjoy the riches and the spoils of that. Uh, no, I, th- I think uh, it's just going to continue to be what it is like. We'll continue to try and grow. We'll continue to hopefully awaken people and open eyes. And, um, you know, m- maybe one day uh, it'll reach a point where, you know, our world has come enlightened enough to where it's like we don't feel threatened by a lot of justice to take place. We don't feel threatened by really just kind of giving someone what they're due. And we don't feel like that's going to make us and yeah. we don't feel like that's going to make us extinct or, you know, there's not enough resources for that. So, um no. We're living, we're living in such an insecure, insecure world. No, it's an, in, it's insecurities, right? We don't feel fr- threatened by the realities that we committed genocide against Native Americans. We don't feel threatened by the realities that the conquest used the Bible and God to justify once again a genocide against, uh, you know, Latin America and manipulated the the, the Tlax Collins to commit yeah. once again a, a a genocide and utilize guns and 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 propaganda to attack and destroy people. And, and then obviously we bail out the banks, we bail out the airlines. And yet 
there's a pretty, I mean, not a simple, this is not a simple, there's no simple solution. There's, but it's wild how much is bailed out, how much we bail out these huge corporate in- infrastructures that represent so few. The people who make the money represent so few. And yet there's this large amount of the United States, a, a growing population of people of color. And it just makes so much sense that it, the only thing, I mean, there's obviously nothing will ever be enough to, to repay anybody for 400 years of slavery or for the oppression that has continued till this moment right now. And, and it continue and it's now again, and you know what I mean? And it's going to continue it, it free education. It's just like, how is that not like free college education? It shouldn't be a question. It should be for, you know all people of color. It just makes sense. I don't, I mean, it's just like, it's like the reality is that how are we bailing out the banks? How is it more expensive to go to the hospital when you're having a mental breakdown than it is to stay at the nicest hotels in Beverly Hills? Very few people know that, man. That's like one of the leading causes for homelessness, medical debt. Medical debt. Why is it? And I, and I got the bill, so I know what it, and how, I know how it goes. I was like, what? How is it $60,000 for a, you know, for a 10 night stay? And I don't have, it's, it's a one bed, you know, and it's not, it's not nice. You don't even get it. You don't even get a toilet seat. You don't get a toilet seat. You don't get towels. You know, you're not allowed to, cause you can do bad stuff with them. And, and yet there are nurses that are kind of disenfranchised. They're not the, the best nurses. And, and not that there's anything wrong. I'm sure there are great ones in psych wards, but usually they're, you know, they're, they're not stoked. I mean, it's not an easy job. Let's be real. Not an easy job. Bless you. I actually shouldn't have said that, but anybody who ever dealt with me in my state, I'm sorry. Um, but the point is, is that how is it that it's that expensive? And the answer is there's a system to, to monetize and take advantage of the people who don't have the insurance, who don't have the privilege. And, and then they become more f- further disenfranchised and on the streets. And then this perpetuates everything. And you only would know if you've ever been in that situation because empathy is lacking. Sympathy is lacking. And the only way I would know is if I went through it and I went through it, I've seen the darkest night of the, the soul. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. And I see the friends of mine and the way that even the staff treated them and, mm. you know, different than, than me. Cause I had insurance, you know, seeing that I was able to have my own room as opposed to share it with three roommates because I had insurance cause I have white privilege and I have a job and to see the way that they, uh, I wasn't cool with the way they talked to me. And, and, and then also the, my friends, because I was like, dude, don't talk to anyone that way, especially someone who just committed suicide yesterday or, and then tried to commit suicide in the hospital. Don't talk to her or him like that. So it's a very, um, Strange thing. Obviously, we're never going to, you and I will help people learn how to swim. <laughs> and then, that's right. And your charity will help people to swim. At, drop in the bucket. Just a drop just, in the bucket, you know. Just, just a drop in the bucket. And, and, you know, time, time, time. And everything. Everything, you know, time. All, all great dynasties throughout history had their time. You know? Yeah. It had its time, you know. So so that's it. We just take it at present moment. And, uh and that's, from there. you know, I have one last, <laughs> amen. One last section before we, we always do this. It's super quick. And I know we're over. I know we're over. I'm so sorry. This is a, it's called our rapid, our rapid fire section. Cause I want to end it on some positive energy. Quick, 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 right. as fast as you go. Okay. And you just, first thing that comes to your head, you say it. All right. Okay. LeBron James or Kobe Bryant? Kobe. Okay. Michael Jordan or Scotty Pippen? Scotty. LA or New York? LA. Pizza or pasta? Pizza. Netflix or Disney Plus? Disney. Burger or hot dog? Hot dog. Dodgers? Dodgers. Doesn't matter. Ah, I was going to say Dodgers or Lakers. It's hard for me to choose two. I'm like, I, don't, I can't oh, choose. Uh, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Another team. Huh? No, no. It's just Dodgers. It's like, I, I was like, come on. I was going to, yeah. It's, and that's it. So I just wanted to say, <laughs> LA, LA team, that's a tough one. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I mean, that was a really poignant interview and your time is so valuable. We're going to find a way. We're going to get past the stoke in on this and find, you know, and, and this is a great, the great way. And also for, for you to come out there when we go in, in summer i mean there's no better way i mean surfing a better way <sighs> the ocean that's it man it's a world so, of opportunity a world of aquatics people gotta know how to swim to be able to enjoy it though danny man nothing but love and gratitude to you, you for having me on the show today you've had me you've asked me questions man you've told me about how much you love and support what we're doing so now it's time for me to put the spotlight on you sir 
with good. all these people listening. Okay, all these people that are gonna go and watch suffer for good after the it's same podcast, same. Okay, <laughs> same same right. <laughs> good after they hear this podcast, Danny. I need to know. Can we get a verbal pledge, a verbal commitment to you right now toward my nonprofit, this Swim Uphill nonprofit, brother? Hundred percent. Yeah. What are you talking about? You can even send me the send me the link right now. What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a verbal pledge. Whatever number you it's, send, the link I'm gonna send to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll. Uh, oh, so you're going? Okay. We'll do hundred hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. There it is. Dang. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, shoot. Yes. <laughs> like I wasn't expecting that. Like I, <laughs> I was like, shit, the amount. I'm like, dude, that's embarrassing. I'm not swinging it that well. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> shit. I'm like, I, I appreciate that. I Thank appreciate you. That you could have said one dollar, and I would have still had a smiling face, just because, bro. I mean, it's a drop in the bucket, man. But you multiply that one by a hundred. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're with that. Thank you. We're gonna multiply it by a hundred. That's right. Service. Well, thank you so much for having, uh, having, I was like, I'm about to say, thanks for having me on your pod. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, yeah. Swim uphill podcast. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on. And, and I want to say, yeah, send me the link. We'll make the donation and obviously go get them. I can't wait for 2028. I'm going to be there in the stands clapping. Come on, let's go. And obviously, we, we know you're going to slay it in the next ones, but 2028, there's something really... 2024, but 2028 is something real special. <laughs> That's the one. I'm feeling gold. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you so much. The Broken Dub Podcast is executive produced by Ellen Utrecht, edited by Megan Solano. Audio by Dory Bavarsky and artwork by Neve Bavarsky. Please like, subscribe, follow, stock, DM, love them all. They're amazing. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your rave reviews, your shares, your comments, your spam to your friends, your email blasts, your clubhouse chats about this episode. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the love, the merits, the accolades, the attention, and most importantly, the thumbs up. Talk soon. We're out.